just one of them beautiful days. Most of the time you hear these seagulls all the time, you know. But there was none that day. It was spooky quiet. I looked down and there was a box of 22 shells and I said, wow. I reached down and picked those up and I said, man, this is going to be my lucky day. We were just about ready to make the set when we felt this tapping vibration in the bottom of the skiff. You know, we heard this roll rumble, rolling rumble. We didn't know what it was because it was severe. And it started rolling. And it was just uh, like that first. You got to remember, this is during the Cold War. My immediate thoughts were the nuke Anchorage. It was just awesome. All hell broke loose, and the ground started rocking and rolling. And uh, my little buddy told me, earthquake, run. So we started running. The earth was opening up right across the street, right in front of me. And black water was shooting up in the air about, I would say, 15 to 30 feet. The tops of the foam poles snapping off. The trees were whipping back and forth. And it just kept right on a shaking. And as, as it got long, further along, it was worse. As we stood there on the corner, the first of the standard oil tanks began to explode. Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of gallons of fuel that were burning. And it burned and burned and burned. It was light as day that night, except for the black soot that was falling. March 27th, 1964. Alaska had experienced the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in North America. The magnitude 9.2 quake left Anchorage and other communities devastated. And although there would be aftershocks for weeks, for most of Alaska, the worst was over. But for many coastal communities, the horror was only beginning. The mega-scale earthquake sent multiple killer tsunamis onto Alaska's shores. Most fatalities occurred in Seward, Valdez, and Kodiak. The channel completely emptied out. You could actually see the bottom of the channel. And we should have realized, I guess, that the water was going to come in rapidly, but we were fairly ignorant of the tsunamis. No cresting wave. It was just this huge surge that came up. And took the bo what boats were left in the harbor and basically rolled them around town. So it come way up in and washed all of that, uh, washed all of the town out down below, just everything, everything. Turned and started running, and, and it happened about as fast as I just told you. When the water went back out, it went down through the channel, just whoosh. It may have been uh, like 20 or 30 knots of current going through that channel. It's incredible. of man in a boat with no oars or nothing. He was just sitting there, just probably just paralyzed, you know. And he was going around and around. Over 30 people died in, on Kodiak Island. Uh, it's relatively sparsely populated. It happened at a uh, time of day when most people were away from the harbor and the, and the businesses downtown. They were at home already. And if it had happened in the earlier, uh, it was the loss of life would have been a lot higher. Kodiak's devastation was caused by the main tsunami wave that was triggered out in the Gulf of Alaska. But Seward experienced a phenomenon called local tsunamis, which were generated by landslides in nearby Resurrection Bay. These waves were far more dangerous than the main tsunami, which struck later. Bob Eads and his brother were south of town on Lowell Point when the first locally generated wave hit. The first wave came in way over in that direction. That's when the ocean was boiling with them big boils there and it went clear over 4th of July at treetop level over there and clear around to the head of the bay, clear out to the airport, 
We were into the small boat harbor and then headed toward Mount Marathon and took the small boat harbor out. Bob and his brother jumped into their pickup truck and tried to escape. I, didn't, I couldn't uh, outrun it, but it overtook us and uh, we was under about 15 feet of, of uh, water. That covers up and it got awful dark. Blacker than the inside of a goat, you know. We thought, well, uh, it's uh, just about the end. And then the, we seen the daylight come. The water went down and back out. The brothers miraculously survived, but what no one knew was that the main tsunami from the Gulf was bearing down on Seward. The water just completely emptied right out of the bay. You couldn't see anything. Resurrection Bay is approximately 900 feet deep, and what just startled me looking out there was there was no water, absolutely no water as far as you can see. The bay is 18 miles deep and uh, two to three miles wide, and I could see no water at all, and I commented to my dad about it, and that should have been a warning sign to turn around and get out of there, but we didn't. Coming back into the bay was this big swell. I mean, great big swell. And it, was, it wasn't a round one like that went out. It was Coleman at the top. And somebody screaming, get out, get out. Tsunami coming, tidal wave coming. Get out, get out, go to high ground. It was uh, this barge, and it had a big crane right at the back of it. It was just like a skier, and he was just skiing right going out of town with this big swell. And as I went around the corner and started up the hill, well, the, the box cars and the railroad tracks and or railroad uh, cars hit me right in the back of the wrecker, and I would say probably pushed me up the hill about 20 or 30 feet. By then, Doug McRae and his family had scrambled onto the roof of their house. We took a wild, wild ride. It was like a surf ride. There was power lines that we were worried about getting scraped off the roof. There was tree limbs, and we were spinning and bouncing off trees. And this, this one on... I, I'm just guessing maybe 10 minutes. And we got wedged in amongst some big trees, big cottonwood trees. Power had gone off, the sewers were gone, the water was gone. There was absolutely nothing left in the way of utilities. All the docks had completely disappeared. There were just a few, few stumps sticking up there. It's really a mess. And uh, basically for us, sewer was gone because uh, our livelihood was gone, our our employment was gone, the canneries were gone. And finally I turned to my mother and said to her, well, Mom, there goes your All-America City. And we laughed. In Valdez, all the waves were locally generated. Tremendous land movement during the quake initially caused the water to literally stand up and collapse into town. Then, 93 million cubic yards of glacial deposits under the dock area slumped and generated a 30 to 40 foot wave. Freddie Christofferson, then 13, described what he saw. Danny Feeks and I went down on the dock to see the boat and load, and then we were leaving. Earthquake started, and then Danny and I ran. I looked back and I saw the boat go up. Then it took off, and then I saw the dock go up, and then we kept running up to Stiff's Waters. I got a ride with um, some guy in a pen, and we went out to Six Mile Hill. Then we waited for a while, then we went back in. Four decades later, that memory remains burned into Fred Christofferson's soul. It was uh, the biggest, blackest wave that I had ever seen. I was turning around watching it uh, with my little buddy hollering at me up the road here, run, run, don't look, run. I looked back and I saw the ship. It was about 30 feet out of the water and the stern was, was in the air and the bow was, was pointing right down into the water. I could see the prop slowly turning and water coming off of it. Great big crevasse opened up and I didn't know if I was gonna make it. 
the longshoremen and the, and the visitors that were on the dock running this way, trying to get to the shore, and it broke away from the shore, and they ran this way to go to the boat to look for some protection, and there, there just wasn't any protection. They just, uh, finally the dock hole busted up, and they all disappeared, never to be seen again. They were gone in just a moment. I just couldn't imagine the people that were on the dock and what they, what they, the last minutes of their lives and how they must, must have suffered uh, knowing what was going to happen. A short time later, at the far end of Port Valdez, the Chute Bay glacial moraine above and below the waterline avalanched and collapsed into the bay. It generated a 220-foot wave. It was the tallest wave recorded anywhere during the 64 quake. Delbert Ferrier and his father were in a skiff a short distance away when the monster passed by. That's when I saw it wipe out, take all the concrete off the light, wipe that out, and go over the top of that little island and go in front of us, and it was starting to break on top. So, but we were just getting the big rollers. We were going up and down, you know, not knowing which, what the hell was gonna happen. And that this missed us. We got more of the roller part. Had we been back there, well, you know, it would be done. By the time this wave reached Valdez, it was still 40 feet high, but it did the greatest damage to the town. In the years following the disaster, Valdez was rebuilt on more solid ground about three miles away. Tsunamis are created by the sudden displacement of water, usually caused by very powerful earthquakes that violently change the elevation of the seafloor. Tsunamis also can be caused by above or underwater landslides, which are often generated by earthquakes. Though far less likely, tsunamis may also be caused by the eruption of submarine volcanoes, meteor impacts, or nuclear explosions. When a tsunami is generated in the open ocean, the water is so deep that the wave is barely detectable, maybe no more than a foot high at the surface but it can travel across the ocean at jetliner speeds of 500 to 600 miles per hour. As that same wave reaches shallower water, it will slow down to about a tenth of the speed and may grow more than 10 times in height. If the lower part of the wave reaches shore first, the incoming surge may actually be preceded by water flowing out to sea, exposing the ocean bottom or emptying channels and even huge bays. Most think that a tsunami appears as an enormous cresting wave, but in fact, most tsunamis come in as a fast moving surge of water, like a monster high tide in fast motion. In addition to the 1964 tsunamis, two other tsunami events in Alaska stand out. In 1958, the highest tsunami recorded in modern history occurred in Latuya Bay in southeast Alaska. An earthquake dislodged a huge chunk of a mountain which crashed into the bay. The impact created a wave that splashed 1,700 feet up a mountainside, completely denuding a slope of all trees and soil. One fisherman was killed when the wave swept his boat out to sea. In 1946, a strong earthquake in the Aleutian Islands that probably generated an underwater landslide created a huge tsunami that wiped out the scotch cap lighthouse perched 40 feet above sea level. Five people were killed. This same wave traveled silently and undetected across the Pacific Ocean to the Hawaiian Islands, where it killed another 159 unsuspecting people. It was this disaster that led to the formation of the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center. The U.S. National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program uh, is the educational program in which communities are advised uh, that they, in fact, live in an area 
uh, in which tsunamis might be expected sometime in the future uh, to attack and to educate the population that, in fact, there may not be much warning time. And this particular program is a partnership between three agencies, uh, U.S. Geological Survey, seismologist uh, expertise, NOAA, which is oceanographic expertise, and FEMA, which is mitigation expertise. So those are the three partners that are working on the federal side. On the state side is the five states affected. That's uh, Alaska and Hawaii, Washington, Oregon, and California. Here at uh, UEF, at the Chief Physical Institute, we are involved in three of the aspects of, of this national program. It, those consist of warning, um, risk assessment, and risk mitigation. The warning aspect that we participate in it uses seismology. At the Geophysical Institute, scientists monitor earthquake data from several hundred seismic sensing stations across Alaska. When a seismic disturbance occurs, this data is instantly transmitted to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's West Coast and Alaska Tsunami Warning Center in Palmer, Alaska. Scientists on 24-hour call quickly analyze that data, along with data from their own network of sensors, and decide whether or not they should issue a tsunami warning. When we see a large earthquake has occurred and it's occurred near the coast, we'll issue a warning to those who could be affected by the wave within a certain amount of time. And then we'll monitor the wave to see if it really was dangerous or not. And if it was dangerous, then we'll expand the warning to, in, to, uh, to all the people that it may be dangerous for. You can improve warning systems. You can do that a number of ways. One of the most obvious is by providing better hardware uh, to measure earthquakes more accurately, but also to measure directly the tsunami itself. As part of the DART project, Deep Ocean Assessment and Reporting of Tsunamis, NOAA has developed a system of six ocean buoys which help measure a potential tsunami. Attached to the buoys,